Until recently, I've known very little about Juniper other than it was named after a tree. Many like me come from a Cisco background, but it makes sense for us to diversify and to know how other vendors do things. On the surface, Juniper CLI looks quite different, but I've discovered that it's not as difficult as I once thought it would be. So, in this video, we're going to go from never having seen a Juniper router before to being comfortable with their command line interface. And if that works out well, we'll take a look into some more advanced configurations in future videos. Juniper uses software called JunoS, or maybe Junos, I think Junos sounds right, which is based on FreeBSD. They use some form of Junos on all their equipment, which is an instant win in my opinion. This is a very different approach to Cisco's, where they have iOS, iOS XE, iOS XR, NXOS, and probably a few more that I haven't thought of. Having just one operating system makes it easy for us to learn and use any of their devices. But to try this out, we're going to need some sort of lab. I don't know about you, but as I'm new to Juniper, I don't have any of their routers lying around just to play with. So one option we've got is creating a virtual environment in uh, VirtualBox, GNS3, or something like that. I've found from a bit of research that there's an old uh, Junos version called Olive, uh, and that's free to download. So just Google Junos 12 OVA, and you'll find the file you need. I also found that you could download a much newer 60-day trial of VSRX, which is their virtual firewall, or VMX, which is their virtual router. So you could run those in a virtual environment as well. But I'm gonna take a different approach to getting started. I'm going to use Juniper's VLab, which is a free online lab environment, similar to Cisco's dCloud, if you're familiar with that. I'll include a link to the VLab in the description. You'll need to create an account, which could take up to 24 hours for them to activate, but once you've done that, you've got full access. Now, as you can see here, there are several pre-built labs that we can try. To start with though, I'm just gonna use the standalone VMX lab. You click the launch button to get that one started. And this brings up the lab blueprint. In a more advanced lab, we would see several devices linked together, but in our case, there's just that one standalone router. At the moment, we don't have a lot of options to choose from as the lab is not yet running. So to start the lab, click the reserve button on the top right. This will reserve real resources for you and it will deploy the lab, which will take about 10 minutes. After setup, you will have access to this lab for three hours. So go ahead and click that reserve button. All right, the lab is set up so we can get started. When we click the router, we have a whole bunch of new options available. So we'll launch our SSH session, which connects us to our router in a new tab. And this is the Junos CLI. Unfortunately, the text is a bit small. I couldn't find a way to change it for this video, so I hope you can read it. The first thing to know is that we can use the CLI in one of two modes. The first mode is operational mode, in which we use show commands, uh, it's where we do our troubleshooting, it's where we verify the device configuration and so on. In short, you don't make any changes in operational mode. The second mode, however, is configuration mode, and that's where, as the name suggests, you configure your router settings. Right now, we're in operational mode, and we know this because of the greater than symbol at the end of the prompt. I have read that on a real device, you can log in with a root account, and you'll log straight into the Unix shell, not Junos like we're seeing here. So if this does happen to you, just type in CLI and that will bring up the prompt that we're seeing. Also in the prompt here, we can see the name of the user who is logged in, which is followed by the at symbol. After the at symbol is the router's name. In general, the normal CLI rules still apply. Uh, we can use the question mark to get some context sensitive help, perhaps to show us what show commands and what keywords we can use. We can use show commands to get information we can tab or space complete these commands. For example, we can try tab completing show con, which shows us that we can match a few commands. If we put a few more letters in there, we can tab this out to show configuration. Uh, this shows how the router is configured and we'll have a bit of a look at that shortly. But also be aware that space does the same thing as tab. 
So if you're typing away and you hit space to go to the next keyword, it will complete the word you're currently typing, which I think is fantastic because you'll usually end up with a full command on screen, not the shortened commands that you sometimes see when you scroll back through your config on a Cisco iOS router. I think this is a good good method. And of course, you can use pipes with your commands to filter output. And this is based on FreeBSD, so you can use some Linux-like commands like grep and mix that with regular expressions if you want to. But enough of that, it's time to have a look at the configuration that we saw a moment ago. Uh, we got that with the show configuration command. All these curly braces and the indentation makes this config look a bit like Java or C code to me. And honestly, the first time you look at it, it does feel a little bit intimidating. You kind of wonder to yourself, do I have to learn a programming language just to configure the router? Well, the good news is it's not as hard as you may think. I think you'll agree with me by the time we get to the end of this video. What it's doing by using the indentation and the curly braces is it's creating groups of information to make the configuration easier to read. Every line that we see here is called a statement. And there are two kinds of statements. Any statement that is used to group other statements together is called a container statement. These are the ones that end with a open curly brace. Any statement that does not group other statements together is called a leaf statement. Leaf statements contain the actual configuration information. They are essentially settings like uh, an IP address or a route. Combining the leaf and the container statements forms the hierarchy that we see here. As an example, take a look at the routing options section. The routing options line is a container statement. This is used to group configuration relating to routing. Under that, we have another container statement called static. It's used to group all static routing configuration together. And finally, under that, we have our leaf statement. This is a static route containing the route itself and the next hop IP address. Personally, I'm a big fan of how all this is structured. It makes it so much easier to understand once you've had a bit of a play with it. It also makes it really easy to show just parts of the configuration. For example, we can type show configure interfaces. Sorry, that's show configuration interfaces. And this will show us anything under the interfaces container statement. So in this config, we just see the one interface, fxp0. But imagine we had many different interfaces here instead of just one. We could refine it a bit further with show configuration interfaces fxp0 to see only the configuration for that object. And if you've used Cisco routers for a while, you'll be thinking, yeah, but we can do that with the section command on the iOS router. And that is true to a point, but not everything in a Cisco config is organized into nice tidy sections like this. So I think Juniper have definitely won the advantage on this particular point. And of course, we can do much more than just look at the config. There are plenty of other commands we can use. For example, show system uptime will tell us when the router booted and how long it's been up for. Show route will give us the routing table. With many of these commands, we can change the amount of information we're being given using keywords like brief or by using the keyword detail. And show chassis routing engine can give us CPU usage information. In short, there's a lot of different show commands that we can run in operational mode. These three have just been a few examples. Now we're gonna to wanna to get some information about the interfaces on the router. To do this, we can use the command show interfaces terse. This is like show IP interfaces brief on an iOS router. This shows us all the interfaces on the router and their IP addresses and so on. There are a lot of devices here, many of them virtual, and they seem to show up whether we're using them or not. If you look over to the right of an interface, you can see the protocol that they use, such as INET, which means IPv4, or INET6, which is IPv6. The GE interfaces that we can see are physical one gigabit interfaces. If we had 10 gig, they would show up as XE, and 40 gig would show up as ET. The EM and FXP interfaces are used for management, and that would typically be used out of band. It sounds like some devices will have one of these types or the other, and then some will have both. 
The LO interfaces are virtual loopback interfaces, and there's no surprise there, they're just the same as any other device. There are plenty of other interface types here, but we're just starting with the basics, so we'll ignore them for now. You will notice, of course, that some interfaces have a dot and then a value after them. This is how Junos creates logical interfaces, which seems in some ways to be similar to Cisco's sub-interfaces. The dot and the value after it is called a unit, and we saw this briefly earlier on when we were looking at the configuration. Basically, an interface can be divided into logical units. We can apply physical settings to the regular interface, such as the link speed, the duplex, and so on, and then we can apply logical settings like IP addresses to the unit. And we'll have a bit of a look at this further when we come to configuring them. Now we can get to the fun part. We'll have a look at some basic configuration. We need to enter the configuration mode by typing in configure. And notice that the prompt changes and now ends with the hash character. There's also a line of text just above the prompt saying edit. This is called the banner and it lets us know which part of the hierarchy we're editing. Right now, we're just at the root of the hierarchy. When you're in config mode, the hierarchy feels a lot like a file system. Each container statement feels like a directory, but instead of containing files, these contain configuration settings. And because this feels like a directory or a folder structure, we can use the edit command to move around, much like we use the cd command in Windows or Linux. For example, edit protocols takes us into the protocols directory, if we want to call it that. Notice that the banner updates to show us where we are in the hierarchy. We could then use edit to move further into it by going to the BGP area. And if we want to go all the way back to the start, we can just use the top command, which will get us to the top of the hierarchy. And if you want, you can move through several levels at once. There's no reason why you have to do it one at a time. If we go too far, we can use the up command to move back one level at a time. And while we're in configuration mode, we can't just run regular commands like we would in operational mode. Instead, we have to use the run command first and then use our regular command. If you're familiar with Cisco's do command, it's basically the same thing. And when you're finally ready to leave configuration mode, you can type exit. We're being warned that configuration hasn't been committed yet. Uh, don't worry about this for now, I'll get to that very soon. And now that we've exited, we're back in operational mode and the banner is gone. So now that you have a basic familiarity with how to navigate around configuration mode, let's actually configure something. How about we go and change the router's name? First, we go back into configuration mode. The device's name is under the system container statement, so we navigate there using the edit command. For interest's sake, if we use the show command while we're here in configuration mode, we will see the configuration that is in place for the hierarchy level that we're currently in. So as we've moved into system, when we type show, we see the existing system configuration. And this includes the hostname statement. To set a particular value, we use the set command. This changes or creates a leaf statement in the configuration hierarchy. So to change our router's name, we use set hostname and then type in our new name. But if we look at the prompt, the router's name hasn't changed at all. Why is that? This highlights a key difference between iOS and Junos. When a change is made in Junos, the commands are entered into the candidate configuration. The commands here are not applied immediately. So to explain it a different way, the candidate configuration is any commands that have been entered but have not yet been applied to the device we're configuring. Commands that are active are in the active configuration. And this is roughly the equivalent to the running config on a Cisco router. If we want to see the commands in the candidate configuration, we enter show and then pipe it through the compare keyword. This compares the candidate configuration to the active configuration and shows us the difference. In this case, it's removing the old hostname statement and adding a new one. When we're ready to apply the settings, we need to commit them. Once we do this, we notice that the router's name has been updated. This has taken the candidate configuration and added it to the active configuration. 
If you've finished your configuration, you could use commit and quit. This will commit first, and as long as there's no errors, it will take us straight back to operational mode. Overall, I really like using the commit method of configuration. It enables us to get all our configuration worked out and then apply it all at once at a suitable time. By default, Junos will automatically write the committed configuration to disk so it can be loaded when the router starts up. That means that we don't usually need to use write mem or a command like that as we would on a Cisco router. However, if we want, we can change this behavior so we will need to manually write these configuration changes to disk. Right, let's have a look at some very basic interface configuration. We're going to add a new IP address to loopback zero. So we'll enter configuration mode once again and use edit to navigate our way to interfaces, then LO0, which is the interface name, then unit 12, which is the logical configuration that we talked about earlier. I just chose unit 12 at random and family INET, which is the IPv4 address family. Now that we're in the right place, we can use the set command to set the IP address to 1.1.1.1 slash 32, and finally commit and quit. In show interfaces terse, we can see that the new IP address has been applied to the interface, and as you would expect, it can ping as well. So I've shown you the long way to configure an IP address. There is a more efficient way. If we know exactly where the configuration is to be applied, we don't need to navigate there first using the edit command going step by step. Instead, we can just use this set command and put the entire path on a single line. I'm doing that here to put uh, one more additional IP address on a different unit of the same loopback. And if we look at the candidate configuration, we can see that the config has been generated just like it was last time. Now's a good time to try out the command commit check. This checks whether our candidate configuration has any problems without actually committing it to the active configuration. And our config does indeed have a problem. As it turns out, Junos doesn't like to assign several different units to a loopback interface. Instead, the Junos way is to put multiple addresses in a single loopback unit. So we'll erase our faulty candidate configuration by running rollback from the top of the hierarchy. This erases everything in the candidate configuration, which we confirm with show compare. Instead, what we'll do is we'll add additional IP addresses to the existing unit that we created earlier. If we run a commit check now, we'll see that there are no errors present. And finally, we can run a commit and quit. Show interfaces terse confirms that we have the new IP address set correctly. And ping confirms that it's working. Our last piece of interface configuration is to see if we can disable the interface and then enable it again. This also takes place in configuration mode. So to do this, we set the interface to disable, and then we commit the changes. This is somewhat similar to using the shutdown command in iOS. If we look at the interfaces again, we can see that the loopback is indeed down. There's no enable command like there is with disable. When we disable an interface, we're adding a leaf statement to the active configuration. So to enable the interface again, we need to remove that disable statement. So to remove any statement from the configuration, we can use the delete command. This is the same as using the no command in iOS. And if we commit this change and look at the interfaces once again, we can see that the interface is back up as we expected. We've finished our configuration now, so we can go back to the sandbox tab we can end the sandbox, which releases the sandbox for someone else to use. So have you found this to be a useful introduction to Juniper? Let me know what you thought in the comments below, because if you liked it, I might take this further and run through one of the more advanced apologies next time, maybe OSPF or BGP or both. So let me know what you think, and I hope to see you in the future.